Thank you everyone for joining us for our last energy seminar of the quarter and of the academic year. Uh, we're thrilled and delighted to have uh, Cliff here with us, um, but to introduce him properly, I'm going to hand off to Jill Ferguson. So Jill, take it away. Thanks, Sarah. So I'm Jill Ferguson. I did the Schultz Fellowship last year, and I worked in Commissioner Rick Schaffen's office, and it was the best experience I've ever had. Cliff's the best boss. I'll go into to some transferable skills I think we can all practice um, from him, but I also want to throw out there before I introduce Commissioner Rick Schaffen that the Schultz Fellowship Program is really amazing, and it's changed my career trajectory in terms of what kind of public service I want to practice. So I'll share my contact information in the chat, just in case anyone's interested in this program, wants to hear about it, wants to hear about the placement I had, the things I worked on, uh, can't say enough good things about the program. Now, as far as our guest of honor today, you can see in his bio, he went to Princeton, then Yale Law, worked in the California Attorney General's office. He taught environmental law for a long time. In fact, everybody that we would run into either at the commission or out and about at a conference was like, Professor Rekshoffen, Professor Rekshoffen. So I think he's taught just about everybody in California. Uh, and then he was senior advisor to Governor Jerry Brown. And when Governor Jerry Brown asked him to be commissioner, so something I really thought spoke a lot about his character, he said, do I know enough? And he asked himself that before saying yes to regulating just about every business in the state of California, which is one of the largest you know, economies in the world, right? From energy to transportation, telecom, everything. So I thought it was interesting that he, he made the position not really about himself, but about did he know enough to really do it? Uh, and then when he was commissioner, he worked on everything, as you can see in his bio, from IRPs, building decarb, transportation electrification, the long-term gas proceeding, equity, so many things. But to get back to the, the reason why I really am honored to introduce him today is he really was the best boss I've ever worked for. And I think two things before we, we let him take over and unleash him. I think we can all do a little bit of what Cliff does, which is one is treat everybody the same, same kind of level of importance. As an intern in the office, I felt like I really did matter just as much as his advisors. And that is not something you can say a lot about other working environments. He was really interested in what I was thinking, what I was writing, gave me feedback, positive and constructive. Um, and just make sure I was invited to every meeting, big ones, little ones, planning ones, you know, external ones, just, it's really, it really is something to be treated equally as an intern. The second piece of advice I think that I, I observed from Commissioner Rekshoff in this normalizing asking questions until you really understand something. It's when you're regulating so many different industries, it's almost impossible. It's, 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 it is impossible to know everything. You have to rely on your advisors. You have to rely on people, but he made sure that in every decision that he's making, he understands it, he can communicate it, which meant being bold enough to say, I don't get this and making sure he asked that question until he got it. And so that he could explain it to someone else or be didactic with someone else. And so I would say he showed me that questions are not a weakness and questions should be more welcome in the work environment. And for that, I'll always be thankful for those two lessons. I'll always try to be more like you. So with that, I'm going to pass it along to Commissioner Rekshoffen to tell us more. Thank you that, for that incredibly generous introduction. And I think anything I'm going to say is going to be downhill after all those plaudits. It's incredibly generous and gracious of you, Jill. And it, uh, for those of you who are interested, the Schultz Fellowship is wonderful. And I had the pleasure when I was a commissioner at the PUC to have <clears throat> three different fellows who were all magnificent. So I, I really encourage people to uh, to look for that. I mean, there's opportunities throughout California state government, uh, in, throughout it, it, the state energy agencies, rather. Well, I'm going to talk about, uh, I'm not a commissioner anymore, so nobody has to call me commissioner anymore. Jill, you don't have to call me commissioner anymore. I'm going to talk about a set of policies that I worked on when I was at the Public Commission dealing with promoting uh, environmental justice, I just want to start uh, by level setting a little bit about what the California Public Utilities Commission is. M many of you may know this, some of you may not. It is one of 
the most important state regulatory agencies in California. It regulates all of the private utilities in the state, and that's most of the energy, most of the electricity and gas utilities, about 20% of the state's water utilities, as well as ride-sharing companies. It also has some regulatory control over communication services, although much less since the telecom industry was deregulated in the 1990s. It also regulates rail safety. So it's a very broad mandate it was it was a body created in the early 1900s along with a lot of other utilities commissions at the time originally uh created to regulate the railroad industry one of only two state agencies in the san francisco bay area at the time reformists wanted to keep the puc out of the the grip of the railroad lobbyists who were circling in sacramento so that's why the puc is in uh, mostly in San Francisco, although there are offices in Sacramento and Los Angeles. And it's a constitutional body, which means it's somewhat different than most state agencies who report directly through the executive branch to the governor. The PUC has five members who are appointed by the governor for fixed six six year fixed terms confirmed by the Senate. But constitutionally, it has independent authority and, and very, very broad authority. Uh, now. Commission, public utilities commissions are not always well known. I, I came across this quote recently that I think is interesting as we have our discussion. Um, uh, it's from a public interest group called the Chisholm Legacy Project. And it asks, how many of us fully understand who are the entities responsible for ensuring the air we breathe is clean and whether the energy we use is safe? Uh, for maintaining affordable electric bills, for providing access to resources to help us conserve energy, for ensuring that customers are not cut off from our heat, our water, and our electricity supply. Each state has a little known entity that holds a significant level of responsibility for all these aspects of our daily lives. Some states call these bodies a public service commission, while others call it a public utilities commission. In California, it's a public utilities commission. And I, I show that to you to make the point that public utilities commissions are not always super well known, but they are extraordinarily powerful uh, in this moment. They play, and the PUC in California is certainly in this position, they play a, a critical role in our clean energy efforts, in our decarbonization efforts, more so than ever with the spate of federal and state legislation. So the Public Utilities Commission uh, is a very important body, even if it's not well known to the public, by the way, and I'm happy to talk about this in question and answer, a wonderful place for uh, clean energy professionals and lawyers and other others who want to work in this field. Um, okay, so I'm going to start by uh, giving you some context about environmental justice in California. Some of this may be from quite familiar uh, to people. Uh, it, as in many other states in California, policymakers have known for years, decades, in fact, that uh, environmental harms are not equitably distributed, that there are certain communities, low-income communities and communities of color in particular, that bear disproportionate burdens, higher air pollution, poor water quality, more exposure to pesticides, more exposure to extreme heat, closer to power plants and refineries, and so forth. California was has been one of the first states in the country to try to deal with these problems. It was the first state to define environmental justice in statute and to direct some state agencies to make achieving environmental justice part of its mission. Uh, and then about 10 years ago, California uh, rolled out an analytic tool known as Cal EnviroScreen. I don't know how many people are familiar with this, but it's a very powerful tool created by the California Environmental Protection Agency. And what it does is it takes a whole lot of information about a community's vulnerability to environmental hazards, whether or not it's linguistic isolation, rates of education, income level, employment, and so forth, 
and combines that with actual environmental exposure data, air pollution, water pollution, toxic waste, pesticide exposure, and so forth, to come up with a score by census tract of which areas of the state are the most environmentally burdened or the most environmentally disadvantaged. This tool has now been emulated by other states. It's, it's been emulated by the federal government, the Biden administration in something called It's Justice 40 Initiative has followed this. But this tool is one way that the state has really embraced trying to get a handle on where environmental injustice occurs and how to address it. So for example, the state has passed legislation saying that the proceeds of our carbon pricing policy, our cap and trade policy, some portion, about a third of those, the proceeds of the sale of, of, of cap and trade allowances have to be spent to benefit the most disadvantaged communities as determined by this policy. So that's one very, very important tool. In addition to that, in the clean energy space, the states over the years has adopted a number of measures directing the PUC and other agencies to incorporate environmental justice into various programs. One of the most important statutes was one passed in 2015 known as SB 350, which established at that point a very aggressive 50% renewable portfolio standard, and that required the PUC in its integrated resource planning process to prioritize pollution reduction in disadvantaged communities. And it also directed the PUC and the Energy Commission to try to address barriers faced by low-income communities who, who are having trouble participating in energy efficiency and other clean energy programs. And it established an advisory group to provide input to the agencies uh, in doing that. Now, I'm gonna, let's fast forward to 2017 uh, when I joined the Public Utilities Commission. I had worked uh, in the governor's office. I had also, as Jill said, I had taught environmental justice and had actually helped start an environmental law and justice clinic. I was joined, I, when, I, when I was appointed along with me, another new commissioner uh, it was Commissioner Martha Guzman Aceves who had a strong background in working on social justice issues as well. She had worked for the United Farm Workers. She had also worked for the California Rural Legal Assistance Association Foundation. She had worked in Governor Brown's office as a legislative advocate and among many things she worked on in 2012, she helped get passed a bill establishing a human right to water in California, one of the first states to do that. We joined in 2017 and we decided that it would be important to establish an environmental and social justice action plan. And we then developed that over the next couple of years. And, and the bulk of what I'll be talking about now is what's in the plan and how it was adopted. It took a couple of years to do it. There was a process for doing that. And the first question is why, you know, why did we want to do this? What was, what was the reason for needing a plan or policy like this? And there were, there were a few, there were a few things uh, that motivated us. One is that while the Public Utilities Commission was working on environmental justice issues in part, the activities were scattered. They were in different places. They were in different program areas. There was, wasn't a lot of coordination uh, among them. That's number one. And secondly, we thought that a plan would be important to try to integrate environmental justice considerations in all the things that the Public Utilities Commission does. So the Public Utilities Commission sets rates, it adopts policies, it does audits of utilities, it takes enforcement action, it administers grants, it issues permits. There are lots of contexts in which it acts and a plan, an overarching comprehensive plan could provide guidance for all those different activities. So there are those two issues. And then there's just some more, I would say, pedestrian, if you will, but important considerations. Um, like any other agency or big organization, the Public Utilities Commission, the PUC is bureaucratic and people behave bureaucratically. It's just the nature of how people work. 
Uh, the PUC had previously had some high level strategic directives on environmental justice. Um, but in the nature of things, staff, when they're faced with, on the one hand, a very clear directive or clear imperative to do something uh, versus a generalized or amorphous commitment to environmental justice, on the other hand, staff can be reluctant to weigh in and lean in to promote environmental justice or to, to act boldly um, and expansively, on the other hand. So I think the way that some, the, 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 the gist of that is policy matters, establishing a firm policy matters as a way to guide staff and agency behavior, not just staff, but what the work of the commissioners as well. It's also important to convey a message to, to stakeholders that this is what the agency thinks is very important. So there are all those issues uh, that we were trying to work on. And then the reality is that despite the state's best efforts, many of our clean energy programs still have not been equitably shared. And I'll go through a couple quickly. So this is a little bit of a dated slide, but the 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 basic facts are the same right now. We lead the nation in electric vehicle adoption, but the rates of adoption are much higher among higher income groups than in lower income groups. Uh, there are studies that show in the most disadvantaged communities uh, in Los Angeles County and elsewhere, there is near zero rates of electric vehicle adoption, the most disadvantaged being the most impoverished. And it, unfortunately, race also matters. There, uh, a study earlier this year that I read from Cal Matters, which is an investigative reporting unit, found out that there's a, a quite significant racial disparity. That um, zip codes where the residents are three quarters white have much higher rates of adoption than where they are three quarters Latino or African American. The same thing is true with rooftop solar. Uh, California leads the nation in rooftop solar adoption. Over 1.5 million businesses, schools, homes, but it's disproportionately benefited wealthier households. And if you look at this chart and other studies from Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, it'll show you that three to four to five times the rates, the adoption rates are three to four or five times higher in the highest uh, income quartile uh, than the lowest quartile. And, Again, in the most disadvantaged communities, the disparities are even greater. Now, this is changing. This is starting to change. It's improving. Solar adoption is more widespread among middle and lower income households, but there's still a fairly stark disparity. And by the way, the disparity is, the, is worse in California than any other state in the country. Um, and there's also racial disparities, um, similar to what I talked about. So we have those disparate benefits being experienced. And then the disamenities, the impacts are disproportionately experienced in disadvantaged communities. Half of the state's gas plants are in communities with the highest environmental burdens, double the rate of the population in those areas. Low income people, people of color experience much more pollution from other, from refineries and other uh, major greenhouse gas pollutants. Air pollution, we have the worst air pollution in the state, six of the 10 worst air uh, cities. The biggest source by far of that is transportation. Of that, the lion shares from medium and heavy duty vehicles, especially near ports, that level of pollution from diesel trucks, gas trucks is, uh, heavily concentrated in disadvantaged communities. And then we have energy burden. Um, in California, uh, low-income households pay a higher share of their household income on energy, even though they have smaller houses, even though they have fewer energy consuming products like dishwashers, dryers, and so forth. In the Central Valley and Southern California, these burdens are the greatest. This is a chart from ACEEE, the leading um, energy efficiency uh, advocacy group in the country showing the same things true nationally, that lower income people you see on the left and middle, uh, 
people of color in the, on, as you move to the right, elderly people uh, use higher portions of their income on energy. They're also more likely to have um, be disconnected, um, have the utility be disconnected. So all these reasons led us to think it was really important that we have a plan. Um, we, we, we went through a process of about two years where we had workshops, we, we convened staff to develop ideas. We consulted extensively with this advisory group that I mentioned, the Disadvantaged Communities Advisory Group, which is about 11 uh, environmental justice adv advocates. They were extremely helpful. They actually developed their own environmental equity framework that was useful for us um, in adopting a plan. And then the plan was finally adopted in early 2019. Now, one of the key issues is how we defined environmental justice. Um, this, can you, can you guys see this? Is this cut off, this slide? I can see it just fine. Okay, great. Well, I'm not gonna get it. There's lots of definitions these days about environmental justice, energy justice, climate justice, just transition. We didn't obsess over these issues. This is the more this is the traditional definition from the United States Environmental Protection Agency that was established um, in the 1990s and it's been its formal definition for some time. And it says that environmental justice is the fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people, regardless of race, color, national origin, or income, with respect to the development, implementation, and enforcement of environmental laws, regulations, and policies. So we started with this definition, but we wanted to add to it because this definition is really, first of all, it's, it's focused on environmental issues, not a broader set of issues, which I'll talk about in a second. And it talks about fair process, the ability to access the development of policy, and to some degree, fair treatment, how environmental harms or benefits are uh, distributed. We consciously chose to call our policy an environmental and social justice policy to capture a broader and uh, a broader effort and a broader set of, of, of communities of concern. And we defined what we were doing more broadly. So I'm gonna show you two slides that have quite a bit of words on them, but they, they arrive at, help us arrive at the same conclusion. So, this was in the first version of the plan, and it's, it says environmental and social justice seeks to come to terms with and remedy a history of unfair treatment of communities, predominantly communities of people of color and, low income, and or low income residents. These communities have been subject to disproportionate impacts from one or more environmental hazards, socioeconomic burdens, or both. Residents have been excluded in policy setting or decision-making processes and have lacked protections and benefits afforded to other communities by the implementation of environmental and other regulations, such as those enacted to control polluting activities. So what we were trying to do here, first, you know, our regulatory ambit at the PUC extends to utility services beyond just uh, energy, includes telecommunications, ride-sharing communities, and so forth. Um, that's one thing, but we, we really wanted to go beyond the traditional definitions of procedural or distributive equity and to use a broader frame, a broad frame to capture structural inequities. So to include communities, as this says, where there has been historic underrepresentation and exclusion from policy, where the communities were underserved. And our vision was to help address these historic and structural inequities and to proactively advance economic benefits and economic opportunities and most ambitiously, most idealistically to help create a more just society. So we, this, this slide again with, with quite a bit of words, the first paragraph just reflects what I just said, that when we defined in the policy which communities we wanted to benefit, we were looking at communities what, who face these structural, uh, these structural barriers, these structural problems, these historic 
exclusion. Um, and we wanted to get at those, but we also wanted to be expansive. And so the next tranche below, it also includes the communities, the, the worst, the most environmentally burned communities as identified by the tool I mentioned, Cal Screen, tribal lands, tribes have, have been ravaged by pollution and have participated very, very little in the clean, in the clean energy benefits, low-income households, and low-income census tracts. So you can see these prior, our priorities were identified in, um, in these different, in these definitions. Okay, so I mentioned that we, 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 we spent about 18 months to two years adopting a plan. Interestingly, the utilities who we regulate didn't have really vociferous objections to the plan. I, mean, I can't say they were standing up cheering, but they understood it. And, and actually over time, they've come to embrace it. Some of the telecommunications industry questioned how much authority we had over some of these issues even though the, the, the PUC has very, very broad authority to regulate, as an economic regulator, the PUC has very, very broad authority to regulate utilities. The PUC's authority over telecommunications uh, entities is a little more complex than over energy entities because of deregulation. But over, over the energy entities, the PUC has, under the, under the constitution and under statutory law, very broad authority to, to regulate and to literally to do anything quote, necessary and convenient in the exercise of its jurisdiction. So there were some concerns, some staff con had concerns about additional workload, how's this gonna work? But uh, we, you know, it was a, a relatively smooth process with a lot of public input. Okay, I'm gonna talk now about, I'm not gonna go through all of these, don't worry, but I'll, this is the list of the, of the nine goals. What I think is really, as important as the goals is that when the PUC adopted this plan, it adopted action items for every goal and there's sub goals and sub action items. There's 95 action items and the plan is updated every two years and there's a public process to evaluate how well so I'll come back to this, these goals in a second, but there's a public process to evaluate how well the process is working. The way it's implemented, and this I think is, has been helpful for its success, is there are about seven or eight different divisions at the Public Utilities Commission. One that regulates water, electricity, safety, railroad safety, consumer protection, and so forth. So they each have a liaison that comes to regular meetings and is the person responsible for, for tracking how the policy is being implemented within that division. And then there's also this, oh, this oversight provided by this disadvantaged advisory community group that I mentioned, which was established by statute. So here's the nine goals. I'm gonna pull out a few to talk about, but you can see there's an attempt to be comprehensive in part to be, to make the process more accessible, to direct investment to communities. Goal three, I'm not gonna talk about it's outside the purview of the energy seminar, but to try to address high quality water communications and transportation services, those are essential services. If anything we learned in COVID is that having high speed internet is critical to your health and well being and economic uh, welfare. Goal four is about resiliency. Goal five, I'm gonna spend some time about talking about how you enhance public participation at the PUC. Goal six, as I mentioned, the PUC takes enforcement actions. That those, there's a goal to make sure that those protect all communities. Goal seven is about economic opportunity, which I will also talk about. And goal eight and nine are about an internal policing of how it's done. Goal eight is training and staff development. Don't underestimate that. If you don't train people about this, it's not gonna get done. So it, both internally and externally, that's really critical. And goal nine to monitor how it's being done. Um, that's really, really important. Okay, so here's the implementation. So I'm gonna start by talking about a few things that the PEC has actually done to do this. Goal one, 
was to integrate equity and access throughout PUC proceedings. I mentioned that one of the critical motivating factors behind this policy was to make sure that environmental justice is addressed in all the different contexts that the PUC acts. And so to do that, the staff developed standard language that are used in scoping memos that are issued at the start of PUC proceedings. So what that is, is when there's a formal proceeding at the PUC, the judge in charge of hearing it will say, here's the things we're gonna be addressing. Here's what I want evidence about. Here's what, the, this, what this proceeding is gonna consider. And there's now a question about, does this impact the commission's environmental justice action plan? And if it does, then you take certain actions. And one of which is just, you ask the question, should we change the way we're doing outreach for this proceeding uh, in order, because of the special impacts that it, that it might have? Um, so that's just good bread and butter uh, uh, administrative work. You, know, you make sure that you're asking the questions. Jill said, I like to ask questions, to ask questions to make sure you're not overlooking things. And by the way, you come up with some unexpected outcomes. For example, the PUC, among the many things it does, is it it grants permission to create at level at grade railroad crossings throughout the state. And there's a proceeding and a, set, and, and a process for doing that. And when people ask the question in those proceedings, it turned out that in some areas, there were homeless people who were affected by where the railroad crossings would take because people are living in railroad tracks. So the PUC spent some time trying to figure out how particular railroad crossing applications uh, were Needed to be addressed. So you can find, you can find these considerations in, in unusual places. The second goal and a very important goal is to increase investment in clean energy resources to benefit environmental and social justice communities, especially to improve air quality. I think the PUC has been pretty good in this regard. It has targeted its investments in quite a number of areas to disadvantaged communities. So for example, the PUC's authorized about $2 billion in spending on electric vehicle chargers over the past four or five years. And increasingly, it said significant portions of that, 40 to 50%, have to be in disadvantaged communities, have to be serving multi, low income multifamily units, things like that. With the air in battery storage, the PUC two or three years ago created a program, a several hundred million dollar program designed to provide backup ba batteries for, for residences that could be used in the event of power outages, whether or not due to wildfires or proactive public uh, safety power shutoffs. There've been programs directing money for rooftop solar just to low income areas and so forth. So uh, those have been very important. And one point I wanna emphasize to you that it, we really learned through this process, and it may be very obvious to others, it's sometimes overlooked, but there are multiple benefits when you increase investment in these, in these communities. The air pollution benefits may be obvious if there's an electric vehicle rather than a diesel truck, or if there's a solar facility rather than a gas burning facility, but they're very important economic and social benefits to having a battery in your, in your community or a clean microgrid. There job benefits, there may be supplier benefits, there's visibility benefits to showing the community that this is important. Um, there may be the ability to enhance your reliability if low-income communities suffer the most electricity outages. So there's a whole slew of, there, there are important social and economic benefits as well as the straight environmental benefits that come from these investments. By the way, we're very much in line with in doing this with what the Biden administration is doing this Justice 40 initiative, and the state as a whole has been moving in this direction. Last year in the state budget, the legislature directed about $900 million for the installation of heat pumps, electric heat pumps in homes, and said about three quarters of that has to be in low-income communities. And it said about 900 million, it allocated about $900 million for battery, solar plus batteries, and said two thirds of that has to be in low income communities. Some of that might have gotten next in this budget, but I don't know. But anyway, it's very much in line with what the state's doing. It's in line with the additional incentives that have been provided in the Inflation Reduction Act. 
I want to talk about a. This is a sub goal we had, which is to address impacts in environmental justice communities. I don't have time to talk too much about this, but I think it's important. It's really interesting. California adopted the first in the country affordability proceeding in 20, 2018, and we came up with these metrics a couple of years later. And the goal here was to get a better handle on the cumulative impact on ratepayers of all the services that the CPUC regulates, gas, electricity, water, telecommunications, and to spotlight which communities were facing the greatest burdens. So there are three different metrics here. The, I'll just focus on one, for example, the affordability ratio, which, ba which basically says, okay, how much money do you have to spend? What portion of your disposable income are you spending on utilities? So the denominator is, I mean, the numerator is your, the, your utilities, the denominator is your household income minus your non-discretionary expenses such as housing and other utilities. And where, where are people facing the greatest burdens? There's two other metrics that the PUC developed to try to get a handle uh, on this as, uh, as well. Importantly, the, California already has programs that subsidize people's energy bills, but they don't guarantee affordability, especially in a period of time when when, when rates are rising. So this was a very important effort to try to say, we need to get a handle on where rates are going. The first report in 2020 showed that in different parts of the state, the, uh, if you using any of the metrics, but especially the affordability ratio, people are spending way too much of their disposable income on utility services. Could be up to 30% in some cases, but the trend was very disturbing. And this proceeding also highlighted that forecasting for the future, for especially for electricity rates, um, it's going to get worse. It's predicted to get worse. And this is an enormous challenge for the state right now, because one of our key tenants of decarbonizing is to electrify everything. And we can't electrify, we can't afford to electrify everything if we're imposing unreasonable burdens on people who, uh, lower income people are spending high portions of their income uh, on utilities. For the moment, the PUC has been using this as an informational tool. It hasn't been using it as a tool to force any decisions. It's just been something to be aware of as the, as the agency decides whether or not to move forward with the decision or not. It hasn't said this is absolutely a burden you can't go beyond, but it's a very, very important um, rate tool, very important tool to protecting con consumers. Also in this sub goal, addressing impacts in environmental and social justice communities, the PUC really leaned in the past few years on trying to protect the most vulnerable from energy burdens. So two or three years ago, the PUC established a declining cap on the rate of disconnections by utilities. Even before COVID, the, the rates were up to 8% among some, among some utilities, six to 8%, really, really shockingly high, too high. I mean, not everyone was for permanently disconnected, but just you know, very worrisome. The PUC also told the utilities to come up with plans by which people could gradually repay the debt that they owed, arrearage management plans, and in some cases, if you were current on your repayment for a period of a year, the PUC said the utility had to forgive some of that um, some of that debt. This was for very low income consumers. And then most recently, the PUC said, we're gonna experiment in some very low income communities which face high rates of disconnection. We're gonna cap the amount of money, the percentage of your income that a customer has to pay for energy, for, for electricity services. Some other states have started this. It's a very small pilot. By the way, these debt forgiveness and payment as percentage of income pilots, these are these programs are the costs are subsidized by other rate payers. So it's not, you know, the utility is not paying for it. The uh, other rate payers are paying for it, but it's a conscious effort to try to protect low income customers um, from rate impacts. Goal four is 
to increase climate resiliency in low-income and disadvantaged communities. And here the PUC did something interesting. The PUC has a proceeding dealing with adaptation, trying to get the utilities ready to adapt for a world in which climate change impacts will be visited on us. And in that proceeding, the PUC established a definition of disadvantaged vulnerable communities that reflects the relative adaptive capacities of different communities. So it said disadvantage is not just a function of physical risk, not just proximity to sea level rise or, um, or so forth, but it also includes sensitivity to climate change, so your, how much medical care you have, who has fewer resources, your ability to adapt to climate change. And then it directed the utilities to engage in additional targeted outreach to these vulnerable communities as part of their preparation of climate vulnerability assessments. So again, vulnerability, not just physical risk, also the ability of the community to adapt to the impacts of climate change. This is a really important goal, enhancing outreach and public participation opportunities to meaningfully participate in the PUC's decision-making. It's really important because the PUC is probably one of the, probably the hardest state agency to participate in. It's very technocratic. A lot of the PUC proceedings are done through formal quasi-adjudicatory proceedings with a judge and parties. You have to know the rules of evidence. There are complicated ex parte rules. It's really hard for people just to participate in it. It's not like many agencies which have notice and comment rulemaking. The agency issues a notice, you just show up at a hearing or a workshop and you file informal written comments. So there's been a lot of efforts to try to make that process easier. And these are just a few of, a few of them. Um, one is literally to have a place where on a docket sheet, you could submit a public comment in any kind of informal way. The PUC tried, has been trying to do different kinds of outreach, not the usual outreach, proactively seeking outreach with groups who are not usually parties to PUC proceedings and trying new approaches to community engagement. Well, Zoom helped a lot, the pen and being able to do things remotely helped a lot. But for example, in the long-term gas proceeding that Jill mentioned, the, the PUC did a gas 101 webinar to address particularly technical concepts that because that would give people community groups the language to try to participate in a, what otherwise can be a very obtruse and technical, uh, technically challenged process. Last year, the legislature granted the PUC $30 million to try to enhance the capacity of community groups to um, engage in the PUC processes. So that's a really interesting new development. The PUC is in the process of implementing that. One of the really things I'm the most proud of is this this particular effort on the part of the PUC. And this is part of a sub goal of the outreach and access, which is to engage with particular environmental and social justice communities. And this has resulted in the PUC's tribal land transfer policy. Uh, in my view, this is a far reaching land reparations policy. So basically what, the, what it means is that for tribal lands that are owned by utilities, and of course, in some level, all the land the utilities owned was once occupied by tribes in the state, it establishes a preference. The PUC, by the way, has whenever a utility sells property, including land, the PUC has to approve it. So this establishes a preference that the, the land should be transferred to the tribes if it's within their ancestral territory and specifically the utility should offer the tribe the rights a, a, a right of first refusal before putting the property on the market so i think it's a really far-reaching interesting plan um, this picture this was this was a transfer from pg &E before the plan went into effect but the maidu tribe in northern california got land that it uh, back in 2018 a, a remarkably and so uh, jubilant um, process that hopefully will be um, repeated. Goal seven deals with promoting economic opportunity. And 
this is another area where there was some controversy when the plan was um, was adopted because some people said, well, you know, that shouldn't necessarily be the focus of the PUC. But I, I don't, I, I don't. That wasn't the sentiment that carried the day, and I don't think that's, I don't think that's right. Uh, we, we, the PUC directs billions of dollars in ratepayer investments in various programs. It has an economic impact on things that happen in the state, and. Actually, for about 30 years, the PUC has had a supplier diversity program, which has been modeled in many other states, um, which requires the utilities to set goals for procurement with diverse suppliers, women, minority, disabled veterans, now LGBTQ businesses. The overall target is about 21% of total procurement. And as a result of this voluntary program over Last the last year that was reported, about twelve billion dollars was spent with diverse suppliers. Half of which, by the way, half of all the procurement was in environmental and social justice communities. So it's been an engine to provide economic opportunity to traditionally underrepresented communities. The LGBT goal the commission set last year is now one and a half percent. That's the most ambitious goal uh, in the country. So this goal also talks about promoting high road employment and career paths for residents of environmental social justice, justice communities. The thought here is we need conscious efforts to promote job quality and job access for disadvantaged communities. It's not gonna happen just by itself. And again, the PUC is directing the investment of billions of dollars. To help the PUC with recommendations about how to do this, the PUC enter, has entered into a memorandum of, a, of a, understanding with the Workforce Investment Board. Um, the first areas are looking at transportation electrification, um, energy efficiency, and also uh, vegetation management, which a lot of utilities have to do to deal with wildfire risk. Okay, I'm pretty much, I, I'm, I'm pretty much done going through uh, our goals. I, don't, I wanna save some time for questions. I do wanna point out, this is very, very important. The need to monitor efforts to ensure they're achieving their objectives objectives. In the update to the plan last year, the PUC said it's going to establish accountability metrics to develop a regular reporting schedule of the commission's progress on various items. I want to say a couple of things, one, one general thing and then one specific, set of, uh, specific conclusion about California. Uh, this was started in 2017, adopted in 2019. The good news, it's very, very good news, is that environmental justice is now a central tenant of many state and federal climate and clean energy plans. I mentioned the Biden administration Justice 40 initiative, but you can see it in many other states. There, there are about two dozen states that are part of something called the US Climate Alliance, which California is a part of, and environmental justice con concerns environmental justice requirements, guidance, efforts, investment directives are part of many of those, if not all. Some, most of these states, if not all of them, have multiple requirements uh, to achieve environmental justice. So the trend is very much in that direction. Some very far, some farther than California um, in part. And there are also now, if you do some research, you can see that there are some states like Colorado, Maine, Massachusetts, Washington, which now have laws telling their public utilities commissions to varying degrees to incorporate equity in their decision-making processes. These are relatively new, but they're happening. Michigan's opened the docket to do that, do that on its own. So the trend is, is, is very, very good. So the lesson to, to leave you with, policy matters. Policy matters a great deal. Implementation matters a great deal. Accountability matters. Accountability measures matter. Having public input matters, making this a living document matters. The challenges remain. There's still bureaucratic inertia. There's still technocratic bias, expert bias, procedural uh, barriers, and overcoming a legacy of environmental justice doesn't happen immediately. But, process, but policy matters. You know, Putting your, your, your mark down, saying what your priorities are, and then having a comprehensive plan with a lot of boring sounding action items makes a real difference. Can you talk a little bit about your advice on 
I guess, public service in general, you know, when's the, the right time? What, what kind of experience do you need? You know, for, for example, I know like your, your impact on decarbonization policy goes back many decades. Like your, your fingerprints are all over a lot of our decarbonization policy, even before you were commissioner. And then as commissioner, you're, you know, pretty much directly responsible for helping us get to like one and a half million EVs on the road two years ahead of schedule. So it's like big impact. But for all the, the people out here who are students, how do we kind of sort of connect the dots from where we are now to policy impact? Well, there's no one, thank you for giving me, glorifying what I did even more, but there's no one path and the, you know, you shouldn't worry about having the perfect path. I, it's the good news. I mean, we have enormous problems to, to address, but there's never been a better time to work in the clean energy and climate space because there's so much to do. Technology has advanced so quickly. You know, there's, we have federal, we have money, we have federal and state policies in alignment. So I think you, you throw yourself in. If you can be, do an internship for a summer or a year or take a year, if you can go to some place that's not Washington, D.C. or San Francisco and get your hands dirty, you know, doing direct work, that's great. But if not, if you spend five years working for a financing company or a venture capital firm or, or you know, three years for those who are lawyers or whatever, that's great. You can always turn your expertise into the policy arena um, when you're ready. California, between this, all the various state energy agencies, the California Resources Board, very progressive and advanced and sophisticated state and local governments, there are hundreds of jobs that are being filled and they're gonna be continue to be needed over the next year. So it's a great time to dive in. Oh, and by so the way, you, you know, sometimes there's a little sink or swim. On the other hand, in my experience in public service is you got more experience sooner because there's not a lot, of, there's not a million people staffing these. You have to figure out how to do it. You get more responsibility earlier on. Mm, okay. Question from the audience, what changes would you make to Cal Enviro screen if you could? You know, are there factors that you feel that it doesn't take into account that are relevant for the priorities at the CPUC? I'm not the best person to answer because I haven't kept up with the, there's a latest version 4.0 that I think is pretty sophisticated and has more, I think it has 20 indicators now. You know, there are glitches because there's some it, rural areas that were never really that weren't adequately considered um, because they don't have enough, you know, enough sources of exposure, so they don't get into the highest, most burdened areas. And I think this, the states try to, to tweak that, but I'm not an expert. I do know it's state of the art. All the stuff that it does is peer reviewed, and the PUC, like a lot of other agencies, doesn't use it as a talisman. I mean, it uses it in part, but it also uses as you can see from the definition of environmental justice, uh, uses other metrics because it may not capture, like it doesn't necessarily capture tribal communities, but, or, you know, they're, even though they're very disadvantaged. Okay, thank you. Um, so you mentioned that the PUC was directed to include EJ or Cal Enviro screen in the IRP modeling process. And so how did the PUC actually integrate the data from Cal Enviro screen into the modeling or the decision-making to inform this, the resource investments? You know, that's a really good question. And I don't know that we, I don't know that the PUC has done as much as it, 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 it could or should. Uh, in that, although it's still very much a work in progress. It wasn't directed to consider Cal Enviro screen. The, the statute just said the, the PUC should, should the in, integrated resource plan should, should prioritize reduction in pollutants with an early emphasis on disadvantaged communities. So it's part of the mix of factors that goes into the modeling and resource procurement plans that are developed by utilities and approved by the Public Utilities Commission, but it's not a rule of decision that says you absolutely must do this. And it's been a tension, there's been some frustration on the part of environmental groups that the PUC hasn't done more to put the thumb on the scale of say, phasing out gas plants, but the, the PUC has to balance reliability issues and, and other issues. So it's not a hard and fast rule, but that's what happens when you have language that says 
you have to consider this or you have to give a priority to it. It's not an absolute rule of decision. Mm -hmm. And you, you know, you can't necessarily trace it from, from here to there. So, but it's a very good question, actually. Yeah, maybe we can find some follow-up context for these questions. I'll write this down. Um, another quick round, hot topic right now, the income-based fixed rates, you know, could be good for, you know, the ESJ kind of lens, but for maybe rooftop, solar, or battery leases this question is saying maybe not so much so the trade-off there how is the cpuc balancing those equity goals with general decarbonization goals i thought you liked me jill <laughs> when you asked me that question <laughs> this is a big i mean this is a very live issue that this was a, a similar issue arose in the this the very contentious and controversial uh, issue that the PUC dealt with last year, the year before, over over subsidies, the right policy for for rooftop solar. The biggest, the big problem, and then I'll answer the question. The big problem is that we can't make electricity rates go so high that people can't afford to use them, and the burden does fall disproportionately on lower income consumers. And in California, we've traditionally not had fixed fixed rates that pay for the costs of the you know. The, the fixed cost of the system that exists no matter how much you use it, you know, billing and pipes, you know, poles and wires. So because people have been paying for those costs by volumetric energy charges, the amount of energy that they use, the result has been that poor people who use, they, they, they are paying, it's a, it's a regressive, it's a regressive system. Poor people are using more more energy paying a higher share of their income on 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 uh, on energy bills and people who exit the system who use rooftop solar are avoiding some of those charges so we do need to have some reconciling of these competing policies but we also don't want to send signals to people that uh, you can't benefit by adopting efficiency measures or conserving or reducing your load so it's a tough balance to try to figure out yeah. Well, since there are a lot more questions, it's a good thing we have that little discussion section after this to keep it going. So for anybody who wants to ask the questions that we didn't get to, or you want to follow up on the ones that, that we did discuss, join in that link that uh, Thule just put in the webinar chat. It's another little Zoom room. And Commissioner Rekshoff, and we'll keep it going. Thank you so much. Uh to Jill and to Tuli, and of course to Cliff for sharing your expertise and uh, you know capping off the the year with uh, such a interesting and timely topic. And many thanks to one and all. Um, and uh, have a wonderful rest of your week, everyone. Thank you.